This is Artistic Intelligence, where we explore the intersection of art, sustainability, and technology. This show is brought to you in partnership with the United Nations ITU AI for Good, Changing the Story podcast, and State. Now let's join your co-hosts, Neil Sahota and Michael Ashley. Hey, welcome everybody to another episode of Artistic Intelligence. We have a really special guest today, Erica Tandori. She is a legally blind artist, researcher, and academic who's exploring the intersection between art, vision loss, and science. Erica's PhD focused on capturing the entopic effects of macular dystrophy through art, conveying an eyewitness account of blindness. As an artist in residence at Roche John Infection and Immunity Lab, Monash University, Erica creates multi-sensory artworks, communicating biomedical research to blind and low vision audiences across Australia. Erica, welcome to the show. Oh, Neil, thank you for having me. It really is an honor to be here and um, to talk about this fabulous initiative with the United Nations AI for Good. Yes, it's a really, really important topic. Absolutely. Thank you for being here, Erica. Could you tell us a little bit more about your story and how you came to create the art? Sure, Michael. Uh, my story is a bit long, so I'll shorten it. I'm, I was called in to help create exhibitions for people who have vision loss like me um, back in 2018 with Professor Jimmy Ross John at the Infection and Immunity Program at Monash University. So as far as I understand, it's not been done before where exhibitions have been created about science for people with vision loss. And we aimed to make it um, accessible to everyone. So kids of all ages, adults, no matter what their science background, that they could come and learn and enjoy uh, learning about science and be inspired. One of my key hopes is that the kids that come along look to uh, investigate science as, as a future um, education pathway or a career, no matter what their disabilities I think we really need to aim to make disability completely irrelevant. And we can do that. We can do that through AI. We can do that through robotics, technologies. There is a way. I love that. And I well, want to help us get there. That's awesome, Erica, because I, you know, if I were to lose my vision or get impaired, I probably would freak out, to be honest, right? Yeah. And I think what you're doing is a testament, but I'm sure a lot of people are probably wondering, how are you able to do it? I mean, I know, I know. How are you able to do it? Well, I mean, this leads us into visual perception. This leads us into understanding what vision really is. And it's in the brain. It's not in the retina. Hmm. And art is not in the retina. It's in the imagination. Well, I, that's really powerful. Um, tell us a little bit more about the, the art you're actually creating. In this exhibition that I've been creating for the United Nations Global Summit, I've been creating multi-sensory, multimodal artworks. So I'm creating sculptures. As an oil painter, I've now arrived at sculptures where you can actually hold a cell in your hand. But not only can you hold it in your hand, we can incorporate technologies that can translate data. So we can talk about mutations in RNA and DNA and we can use colour coding or sound or vibration. There can be a myriad of ways to actually convey that information and data in a way that's really accessible and understandable to people. It's just a matter of thinking about it and it's a matter of thinking outside the box and oh. hence artistic intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Absolutely. So I want to go back to what you said a moment ago, because I think that that would challenge a lot of people's worldview to say that, you know, vision is not so much confined to the eyes. It's more about the brain. And I love what you yes. said about imagination. Could you explain that for people that maybe don't understand that? Oh, I, I, I experience this every day, Michael. With my vision, I have central vision loss, which means that my brain is constantly trying to fill in the gaps that are missing in that area of dead cells. And the brain is playing wonderful tricks 
to try and make sense of the world. So it's filling in colour and movement. It's filling in the scotoma area with um, people would call it Charles Bonnet syndrome, but you, your imagination will play an active part um, filling in that that space of of seeing nothing because the brain really doesn't want to see nothing. And you really see that interplay between the brain and the retina and the outside world. All we're, we're always using our brains. If you think about looking at something in the distance, you can't touch it or feel it. It's your brain that's taking in the information through the retina and trying to make sense of it. Is it shiny? Is it hard? Is it a leopard coming to get you? How fast is it going to move? There are all those things which are a result of biological uh, learning over time, evolutionary time, and also in our lifetimes. We're actually learning to see all the time. And I think when you do encounter vision loss, you are learning to see all over again and you begin to understand that it's your brain doing this. Um, Sami Ezeki is uh, an amazing neurologist over in London and um, he always said that seeing is understanding and I think understanding is seeing. If you understand something, you will see it. And a major part of the exhibition work that I've been creating is to get people to understand something about science or the biological world. And when they understand it, they can see it in their mind's eye. Mm -hmm. And that's powerful. Yeah. Absolutely. And you don't have to have a retina to do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's all about how we perceive the world, right? Yes, and it is. I think you take too much for granted that we rely so much on our eyes and that's not really necessarily how we really perceive the world, right? Neil, it's about how we perceive the world. Now let's go back to artist, um, artificial intelligence. Can we make artificial intelligence perceive the world in a, in a certain way? We do, don't we? Yeah, we do. It's all about how we train it, right? Yes, how we train it. So it's how we think about the world. <laughs> and how we think about disability and, bl and blindness and vision loss. You know, when you, I'm sorry, when, when you, when you talk about it that way, it reminds me of, um, I heard this conversation about the intelligence in plants and yes. someone said to me, well, how do plants know to grow a certain amount of height? How do they know to yes. uh, get their leaves to go? They don't have eyes. <laughs> and so when you say that to me, or you say that to us, um, you, when you say vision is in the brain, it seems to me we're also talking about that. I mean, it's a form of intelligence. And it, yes. it seems also that we have conventional understandings of the world, but those are not always accurate and we need to expand our thinking. Exactly right. Hence, natural intelligence. And I think for AI, for artistic intelligence, for science, for technology, for a way to understand life, we look to the natural world, to its systems, to its way of working, working itself out. And I think, like I might have said earlier, um, in one of our correspondences, it's life's longing for itself. It's how it's working out, how to be in existence. And I remember hearing an amazing interview with a scientist on BBC Radio one day. She was talking about the internet of trees. The mm -hmm. internet of trees. That's astonishing. Yeah. And how an oak tree knows its own oak seed, you know, over in the distance. And it will, it will <laughs> compared to other oak trees with their seeds, this particular oak tree will know which seed is its own and it will direct energy and nutrients towards that one. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Right. That's nuts. There's yeah. just there's just so much out there that we don't know. Um, and another example is um, I heard about like really powerful microphones recently, and they were able to pick up the humming of uh, queen bees when they're just ready to do whatever they've got to do, and they have a particular type of click which we as humans can't hear. Mm -hmm. So we needed really, really powerful microphones to be able to hear that. And we can use this knowledge now in, you know, farming for honey, et cetera, et cetera. So there are all sorts of things we don't know about in the natural and, you know, the intelligence of the natural world. We're not aware of yet because we don't have the technology yet to access it. But imagine if we do, I think we'll have a whole new respect for, for the natural world. And we've got to have, that's where we came from and we're part of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like your talk of the natural intelligence and 
You know, it's, it's interesting because I've actually studied the, the tree stuff and they have this really amazing communication network, but it's not something that we would fathom as, as humans, right? Yeah. And I, I kind of feel like you're touching on this thing that, you know, pardon the expression here, we kind of have blinders on, right? We're kind of yes. used to the world as we know it. Yeah. So we actually have these, you know, our, our way, our ability to perceive the world could be kind of limited. And I found the best yes. artists see the world differently. Yeah. And it sounds like you've really tapped into that potential. Neil, I discovered that as well. The other day I was doing an artwork, hopefully for the cover of a, of a science magazine, and it was about coronavirus. And I had been looking at old uh, Hindu um, artworks, like patterns. And I think I may have provided this to you in, in one of the um, correspondences we had. It's an image of the coronavirus amongst a network of other coronaviruses. And it's really, when, when you look at those old uh, Hindu artworks, um, those ancient Indian images of patterns, I thought, my God, this is like the coronavirus. It's got the spikes. It's got this network of, you know, joining with other spikes and things like that. And it, it, the, there probably is in our history an amazing human knowledge of viruses and microbes and structures that have been expressed if we look back in history through art. We may actually find those patterns and, and understandings of systems like that. So I, th I think there's a lot to be said about artistic intelligence, but we can also go back in time and find these understandings and re rephrase them in new ways, in mm -hmm. new contexts. There's some archaeologic intelligence mixed in with artistic intelligence. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, definitely. <laughs> definitely. That's a, a very interesting tangent. But also, I, I really like just your, your worldview and your perception. And for people that want to understand you and who you were beyond the art, could you tell us a little bit about your background and who you are as a person? Wow, Michael, I think I've always been immersed in art. My family um, were art dealers and we had a gallery in a prestigious part of town, sort of, I grew up in the world of art and Australian art. I was really, really lucky. So I was always doing art and I was always writing. So, you know, it's always been the creative things that have really got me. But I think in recent years, the science is so astonishing that I sort of also wish that I had paid attention in chemistry and, and biology classes <laughs> because it's so, so fascinating. These are the stories of us. Mm -hmm. To understand biology is just, and bio, biomedicine and bioscience is a story of us. What on earth are we made of? <laughs> You know, are, are we us or are we a series of viruses, microbes, bacteria, <laughs> you know, all sorts of things? And then you, you go into human identity and self-identity and it's just astonishing. I, you know, I think the, the big thing to take away from every, you know, if there's one thing I could sort of get people to think about today is how amazing life is mm -hmm. and what an amazing place this world is. It, and it's beyond our perception, beyond our current perceptions. I think maybe with technology, we can expand that perception. And I think in this time of an existential crisis like we're facing with SARS COVID 19, that um, we, we're rethinking that. We're rethinking the meaning of life. I think so. Uh, <laughs> oh, go ahead, Neil. <laughs> I, I, just, I just want to touch upon that. You made an interesting point in that. You know, we're, you're, you're looking at this through the lens of like nature and biology and chemistry and you made this comment about you know, technology and, you know, mm -hmm. we don't normally associate like technology, maybe, um, maybe form, forming some new forms of art, but what, what is technology giving like you that you couldn't do otherwise, right? How well, is yeah. Look, look, doing my PhD, I had to use technology. I had to... I had to read all my journal articles with the computer. So highlighting the text and getting Alex, you know, the computer voice to read to me. I had to do all that. And apart from that, I just can't type very well at all. <laughs> so I had to dictate to the computer and, um, and I, I wrote most of my PhD talking to the computer. So, I mean, there's small examples. Uh, obviously, I couldn't function without a magnifying glass. 
you know, I need powerful lenses to be able to read things because I'm, I'm very blind to text, um, you know, a, a print disability, so I can't read print at all. Um, sitting here in front of the computer, Neil, I can't see your face at all. So it's just, you know, I can see the outside of the screen, um, but your face is blind to me unless I look to the left or the right. So I need to use the zoom function on my Mac to be able to enlarge images and things like that. So techni technology has been of great assistance. However, I did jokingly say to an ophthalmologist that if we were back in the 1800s, I wouldn't feel so isolated because I could get on my horse and get into town but I can't drive a car in this day and age. <laughs> but a horse would have been really handy. So, yeah. That's a good way to put it. Do you yeah. find, I've, I've often heard, I, I read uh, this book called Follow My Leader when I was in elementary school about uh, a boy who loses his vision um, at a young age and then he learns, speaking of animals, uh, a dog helps him a lot. And oh. they develop this very strong relationship. And in the book, I still remember I was a fifth grader when I read this book. Um, about the idea that when you lose one sense, in particular vision, because it is so central to everything you, you talked about understanding, um, mm. that the other senses are heightened. And, mm. uh, and I wonder if, that, if that's true for you. And also, do you, like, for instance, with myself, I know that I'm a very visual person when it comes to learning. Um, mm. If I, I have trouble remembering books that I hear on yeah. audio books, but I don't have the same issue when it comes to, to reading. And I wonder w what your thoughts are about that in terms of learning for you. Yeah, that's absolutely incredibly true. And even with my vision loss, I'm still a really visual person. And that's the first way I learn and understand things is, is through vision, albeit mottled and, and deteriorating. It's really funny. I don't think my hearing sense of hearing increased in actual fact I think when I'm out say in the old days when you could actually go out to the shops and there were people everywhere um I couldn't see very well nor could I hear that really interfered with my sense of hearing because I can't see people and I so I can't see their lips moving and I I can't infer what they're saying from their expressions or, or their their lips um but one thing that really has increased for me is like a sense of intuition hmm. it just i think that's probably the best word to describe it it's just a sense of yeah it's a heightened sense of awareness uh, um about your environment and um and you know in terms of people coming towards you i can sort of see their outlines and their shadows and you sort of see the essence of people just by the way they walk or the rhythm of them or the essence of them. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a weird thing, but it's not my hearing. It's something else. And I, I would have to just call it intuition. I mean, you were talking earlier about um, that. We're just beginning to understand our world in ways that have been, let's say kept away from us for a very long time. Um, mm. I've read books before um, the Seth material comes to mind where the person that wrote the book um, was saying how there are other senses the humans just don't tap into and intuition yeah. is one of them. And I wonder for you, um, when intuition, when I hear that, I, I think about things like not trusting somebody who, who yeah. appears uh, dangerous, but yeah. I also think about, uh, you know, premonitions about the future. So when you say intuition, what does that mean to you? It does. It does mean a sense about people. It does. And, but you've, you know, I've always got to be careful. You can have it wrong. But, um, and I think in saying that too, I think you're finding because you're not looking at a person, the way they look, their expressions, mm -hmm. what they're wearing, none of that is relevant, but it's, it's so corny. How corny is it that I would actually even mention the word soul <laughs> when we're talking about artistic intelligence and, and AI and things, that there might be something else that we're tapping into and, and finding like a, a common bond, you mm -hmm. know, like souls and like minds. And yeah, these, these are, these, this all becomes a huge philosophical conversation. It, it, it can move into that so fast, you know, from, from the every, what we think is the everyday of technology and, and everything else. But yeah, it's, it's that Michael, it's, it's a mystery.
Mm-hmm. It's some kind of mystery. <laughs> yeah. And I think because you don't have your retina, you're tapping into that mystery all the more. <laughs> and I don't think that's corny at all. I think that's great. I mean, look, yeah. they're, they're, to use your own word, there's so many mysteries there. Yeah. in life and to even pretend like we know what's going on there's just yeah, we d- exactly why pretend i hereby declare i'm a bimbo i know nothing about <laughs> anything and it's great because then you can just learn <laughs> well that's what socrates says neil and i are working on a book we talked about this exact i had this exact conversation last week that socrates acknowledged that that's the highest wisdom is to acknowledge that you know very little or nothing yeah <laughs> There you go. There you go. I'm in good company then. I'm the best company. <laughs> I want to I want to tap into this retina analogy, I shall call it, because your your work is actually phenomenal, Eric. I've had a chance to oh. to take a look at it, experience it. And I just wonder that, you know, if you didn't actually have the advantage of being legally blind, could you have gone down the same path? Could you produce this type of work? And I feel, you know, this actually gave you a huge advantage to be able to see or perceive the world differently. Neil, that's exactly right. When we're presented with some bad news, like, hey, you're going blind, you know, give up, leave art school, that, you know, other doors open, that you're actually given a gift, that in adversary, you know, adverse circumstances, you're given a gift, you're given a choice. And t- take the higher road, go and explore something, you know, hitherto unknown and see where it leads you. So it, it, it is a gift. And, and maybe I shouldn't have left art school. So when I was given that diagnosis, you're going blind. And I said, but how blind am I going to be? How long is that going to take? What is it going to look like? And there were no answers. They can't give you an answer. They don't know. No one knows. But I should have been illustrating that as the blindness deteriorated. Mm. Um, That would have been amazing to to actually, you know, use the visual language of art to to transcribe that journey into low vision and and blindness. But you're right. It's a superpower. People with a disability probably have a superpower because they have another way of experiencing the world that not everyone does. And to actually be, you know, like a traveller in a new land, to be a correspondent sending back letters about what it's like travelling through that space. Mm-hmm. Well, there's, there's an old adage saying that if you always travel with the crowd, you'll see what the crowd sees. So if yeah. you step away, you'll see something that nobody else has ever seen before. Yeah, that's a beautiful thing. Oh, you're lucky. You're very lucky, Eric. I'm jealous. No. Would you like me to come and poke your eyes out? <laughs> I can do that, Neil. <laughs> Look, no. I mean, everyone has their own special purpose and special gifts. Neil, how can you say that? Look where you are and what you're doing. It's extraordinary. Oh, the and grass actually, is always greener on the other side. I was looking at other people and say, man, they're doing such cool stuff. No, you're doing super cool <laughs> stuff. And, and I think what you're doing is actually helping me and helping millions and millions, billions of people. You know, it's extraordinary. I think we've all got a job to do. We've just got to recognize and understand what that is. I, I very much agree. Um, to change gears slightly here, you mm. said something earlier in the conversation, I thought it was very interesting. And for those that don't understand, um, you know, how AI can provide a visual experience, how AI can see, and I would put that with quotation marks. If you could explain how that works for someone that, that is very um, unaware uh, of how that could work and how these technologies are helping people because... And this yeah. is my understanding. This is relatively very recent technology. Yeah. Let's have a look at a simple level. Um, there's a paper about um, uh, cervical cancers and detecting them. And so I think AI was used and, and sonification was used to explore the sequence of the cells. And when there was an anomaly, it would make a different sound. So that in that way you could very clearly, like a simple example of using AI and, and, and data technologies to heighten the awareness of something that your, that your eyes might not see. And 
even in the artwork that I'm creating, we're using simple colour coding or sound um, to relay that data and that information about a mutation or an RNA sequence, uh, things like that. Yeah, I mean, you'll know better than me where AI exists and coexists with, with our daily lives and how it supports us. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, in very simple terms, we can incorporate that into ways that can be, uh, that can heighten accessibility for people with, you know, uh, diverse needs. Mm -hmm. We've just got to sort of further explore that, push it into new boundaries. We've got to know that these are exciting possibilities and let's see where it can take us. Well, I mean, when you say that, 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 I mean, we talked about this other, let's call it a sixth sense, this intuition, yeah. uh, where, where my mind goes when, when it comes to pushing boundaries is what if there is, let's say there is a sense that we just don't understand right now in the same yeah. way we didn't know that sound of the, the queen bee until we had the microphone that could detect it. But what if AI could provide us, I don't know, we call it intuition, some sort of uh, sense about the world that we don't, we can't even understand, we can't fathom right now. That seems to me a, a, an amazing uh, frontier. Yeah, it's an amazing frontier. But do we need the humans to put that information into the AI first? If we don't, if we don't know it's there, how's the AI going to know it's there? I don't know. Unless, and this leads me to my other big question. Can artificial intelligence have its own sense or its own intuition? Can it intuit things? Mm -hmm. so I think the answer is kind of sort of. You can find those hidden connections that we may not be able to see, but only if it's been trained to do that. Uh, you yeah. know, the AI can't imagine, it can't create, which is why I actually think that when it comes to AI and art, it's about augmented intelligence, right? It's not about yeah, necessarily amazing. the machine doing something. It's it's the machine giving us something to improve what we're able to perceive and create. Yeah. So I got to ask Erica, you know, if we, if we move the clock forward 10 years, where, what do you think we'll be at? Where do you think that, you know, AI and art might take us? It can take us into amazing places. I don't know what's going to happen to us in 10 years. 10 years from now, you know, we, are we moving towards a singularity? Is, is everything moving so fast, exponentially, you know, everything moving into one big terrifying <laughs> speed? I, I don't know. Um, I, I do know, though, I think that we really do, we really do need a forum like this we really do need to know that we need to keep AI in check for social good. We need to keep that as a top priority because it can be used for, you know, it's chaos versus control. It's the old get smart movies. You know, it's, we've, we've really got to, <laughs> we've got to use our soulfulness in tandem with our technologies um, and not leave anyone behind. Yeah, I, I, you know, the poor, poor people, people with a disability, people who don't have our economic privileges, are not born, you know, born into lucky countries. Right, uh, I very much agree with you. And, and uh, Neil and I are both on. In addition to uh, AI for Good, we both serve it as ambassadors for City AI to contribute to conversations about how to use AI in a meaningful way. Yeah, so that people don't get left behind like you're, you're saying right now because uh, we know with any technology it has immense potential for good and then immense potential for bad. And I think yeah. that, you know, having, like you said, I mean, having these forums, talking about these things, it's our hope that people become aware of these amazing possibilities and begin to use them for, for wonderful good, uh, things yeah. that people would never have imagined possible. Yeah. The thing about the thing about like computing and AI and things is astonishing. I think it's it's been with us for a very very long time. Like if we look at the and and anti, what's that machine? The old the old Greek machine antith. 
I've forgotten what it's called. But that ancient machine that was that was an ancient computing machine that um Antikythera, that that you know helped travelers or helped merchants uh, predict you know what the weather was going to be like in in ancient times or the babbage machine or whatever we've had this idea of wanting technologies to help and assist us and it's it's like it's part of the human psyche as well and we have to recognize that it's it's part of the human need to create mm. to develop technologies you know whether it began with a rock chiseling a rock and and implementing tools right through our history um, we've got to harness that good. We've got to recognise that, that we have that potential. It can go either way and we have to harness it for good. I, I think we're reaching a critical time. When you say that, is it because of you know, the singularity you're speaking of or when you, when you say a critical time, what do you mean by that? I, I do think the singularity, I think the way things are speeding up, we, we're learning more about the world and, you know, knowledge is power. Power can corrupt, and absolute power can corrupt absolutely. So, you know. Given that, Erica, I mean, if you have a like, you know, new artist today, what advice would you actually give them? Don't stop doing art. Don't <laughs> stop. We need art more than ever. Right. Because we need to think outside the box not lock ourselves into social media or this or that, do stuff, make stuff. That's human. And, and I really do see that the power of making things, tinkering, um, that praxis model of, you know, art practices research, take something, work with it, see what happens, evaluate it, make it again, make it better. Uh, you know, use a centered design, make things that people can use. Um, create things that people understand that give meaning to the world and, and meaning to existence. I think the world of technology, the, our, our computing worlds, you know, all this stuff would be so meaningless without that in it, without that creative input, mm -hmm. without an exploration of, yeah. Well, where would we t where would we take things, right? I mean, we can tap in the hard sciences as much as we want, but without you know, kind of the the experience to kind of guide us or the the motivation, the inspiration. Mm. How far can we actually go? We need that inspiration. We need that motivation, um, and with our problems, you know, this leads us to. Uh, different ways of thinking to solve those problems. We'll always, we are, we'll always need creative thinking, but we've got to foster that in our schools. Yeah. Yeah. I, and we've got to foster wonderment. I would love, I would love the artworks to be able to bring people back to that moment when they were kids and they went, Oh my God, that's amazing. You know, that's just mind blowing. That, that is just, you know, yeah. What a great yeah. state to be in, in constant awe of the things around you. Yeah. How fantastic yeah. things are. Along those lines, I mean, uh, what is, is that what you want people to feel when they, when they experience your art, that wonderment? Or what, what do you want people to feel? How good would that be? How good would that be in, with, with things that we create that people would just go, wow, that's fantastic make people feel alive and, and connected and mm. give them meaning and be in touch, yeah, with creation and just, you know, it's extraordinary. Well, Erica, I, I, <laughs> I really love your work. I don't know if you can give us kind of a sneak peek. What's your next big project you're working on? Oh, my God. Um, the next project that I'm working on is an interactive tactile book about science. So, but it's not an iPad. Ooh. It would be a tactile book that that you can open and it, and it tells you, you know, probably from a simple sort of elementary school level, 
but not. You know, you you can touch this, you can touch the book, you can read the book, you can press buttons, you can interact with it on in multi-sensory ways. And the book, for example, the the one I'm writing now, is about infection and it, it, the immune system, the human immune system, so that you know we can get an understanding of that, if, even though we may have blindness or other disabilities. Um, so to create a wonderful book, I, I don't know if you remember being a kid, but I have memories of lying by the fire with my Basset Hound and I'd open up the Reader's Digest giant book of the universe and, you know, you'd spend all evening just looking at these gorgeous pictures and, and you know, reading little, you know, text boxes about, you know, this galaxy or that galaxy or nebula or black holes or whatever and just going, wow. So I want to create books like that, but that are multi-sensory that you can touch, that you have internet con- connectivity with, yeah, all sorts of, all sorts of things. Um, and the other thing I was doing over the weekend um, was creating um, ASMR science for people with low vision. So I was creating a demonstration of the sculptures that you've seen of the couscous HIV and um, actually creating that but using binaural microphones to give a 3D, you know, audio sensation of creating art. That sounds super. Can you describe that, by the way, um, for people that don't know what some of those terms mean? Yeah, so... Is it... (laughs) Autosensorial... Meridian response. Have I got that right? I probably haven't got that right. I'll have to go back and check. ASMR is how I remember it. But essentially it's you've got your right ear, your left ear, your front and back, and you've got this 3D surround sound. And if you put your headphones on, it's like someone's talking. Yeah. Right <laughs> yeah. But but we're not doing shampooing of someone's head. We're actually right. creating a couscous sculpture of a HIV capsid. And here's the glue. And here's the couscous. Ooh. And we're going to mix the two together. <laughs> so it's been a lot of fun. So that's been my other project. How to actually create it's kind of science art through sound. So that's been a lot of fun. It's oh, been that's a lot awesome. of fun. But, I, but Neil, it sounds hilarious too. Like, you go, oh is everyone going to cringe about this? And am I going to die of embarrassment if I actually, you know, publish this? But I don't know. So we've got I, to see because it's not really been done before. It, it has, but I think given what's going on with COVID-19, we could all use a, a laugh around healthcare for a change. <laughs> yeah, I, re- I reckon so. I know, I know. And it's not a it's not a frivolous topic. I mean, HIV is a deadly, serious, you know, terrible thing. But here I am making a, a couscous sculpture of the HIV capsid <laughs> and describing it. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I, I, and, you know, maybe that's part of it too, that we have to have a bit of fun while we're learning mm-hmm. and, oh, uh, and exploring things. Totally. I, I can't wait to check it out. So I hope you'll, you'll share it with me when it's ready. But I will. I will. I'm sure a lot of our audience would like to learn more about what you're up to and keep track of your latest work. What's the best way for them to stay connected with you, Erica? Uh, they can visit www.ericatandori.com, Art and Vision Loss. They can uh, visit the Ross John Lab at Monash. Um, we probably have some links. Um, we have Data Futures, Monash Data Futures Institute. Um, so a few of those things. I think if you just plug in the names, um, do some searches, and AI will help you get there <laughs> and find it. Right. Well, thank you, Eric. Uh, it's so nice to talk with you today. Oh, it's been great. You're two really, really inspiring guys. So I visited the website. I've got to download the book on, on AI that, you know, that you've been writing and that you've written. And, um, and you know, I think you two are at the top of your field and, and you're doing amazing things. So I, I'm really privileged and, and really privileged and really lucky to be, you know, having this conversation with you both and to have met you. What Thank an opportunity. You. So thank you so much. I'm inspired, Erica. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story and your work with everybody. Oh, thank you, Neil. And thank you, Michael. Absolutely. It's great work that you're doing. It's really, really important work. AI for social good. AI for good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Hey, if you like today's show, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment. If you've been enjoying the Changing the Story podcast series, please subscribe and share it with your friends. Thank you. Thank you.